Welcome. My name is Hubert Savanaya and I'm a hydrologist. Today we are going to talk about evaporation. Of all moisture fluxes over the Earth's surface, evaporation is the largest outgoing flux. Of course, precipitation is larger, being the source of all terrestrial moisture. But in general, evaporation is larger than river discharge, particularly in dry climates. Many professionals, particularly engineers, consider evaporation a loss, precious water that we lose to the atmosphere. This thinking has led to ambitious projects, such as the proposed draining of the Sut wetlands in South Sudan through the Jonglai Canal. But evaporation is not a loss. Evaporation is responsible for all biomass production through transpiration. And moreover, much of the evaporated moisture returns to the Earth as recycled moisture, as we have seen before. If we don't understand evaporation, then we also can't understand river runoff, because they are closely intertwined. There are five distinct types of evaporation, split in direct and indirect evaporation. Direct evaporation consists of open water evaporation, which is the evaporation from a free water surface, Soil evaporation, which is the evaporation of soil moisture reaching the surface through capillary rise. Interception evaporation, the, which is the evaporation of a wet surface after a rainfall event. Sublimation, the evaporation of snow or ice directly into the gas phase. The indirect evaporation is called transpiration the exchange of moisture through the stomata of vegetation. The total evaporation from the land surface is the sum of all these processes. The first four are purely physical processes that transform moisture uh, from the solid or the liquid phase into the gas phase. Transpiration of moisture is a rest product of photosynthesis in vegetation. Some people call the total evaporation evapotranspiration. I advise strongly against it. The term is opaque jargon that nobody understands outside an in-crowd community. It hides the fact that evaporation consists of many different processes. Famous experts on evaporation, such as Will Brutzart and Jim Shuttleworth, they avoid the term. Evaporation is generally constrained by the supply of moisture. Logical. If there is no moisture available, then there is nothing to evaporate. We use the term potential evaporation for evaporation where there is no shortage of water or where there are no other limiting factors besides the availability of energy. The actual evaporation is what you get if you take all limiting factors into account. In the previous module, we looked at the water balance. Here is the water balance. The change in storage equals to the precipitation minus the evaporation minus the runoff. The water balance links precipitation, evaporation and runoff. If we now look at averages, if we take the average over the year, over many years, then this term becomes very small and we may often disregard it if the average is taken over several years. The total amount of rainfall that has fallen over, for instance, 10 years is of course much larger 
than the difference in storage between the beginning and the end of the decade. The same can be said about the other fluxes. So for long-term averages indicated by a bar above the variables, a very simple relation applies, whereby the evaporation equals the difference between the precipitation and the discharge, all of course expressed per unit surface area. Dividing by the precipitation, we see that the proportion of evaporation, the proportion of evaporated precipitation equals one minus the runoff coefficient. So there are two conditions that apply to evaporation. The actual evaporation E is always less than the average annual potential evaporation. And the average annual evaporation should always be less than the precipitation. The first condition is an energy constraint, the second is a moisture constraint. These conditions form the, assum the asymptotes of the Boudicco curve. Boudicco developed a simple mathematical form to describe the relation between average annual evaporation, precipitation, and potential evaporation. There are many mathematical forms, but this is the simplest. For the Boudicco curve, we have a relation between the aridity, which is defined by the potential evaporation divided by the rainfall, and these are average annual values, and this aridity uh, is one in this point. If you are left from one, you are in a wet climate. If you are to the right of one, you are in a dry climate. And on the vertical axis, we have the relative evaporation divided by the average annual evaporation divided by the average annual precipitation. And of course, this is bound by a maximum one, which you could say is the moisture constraint. You can never have more evaporation than precipitation. And on the other hand, we have what we call the energy constraint. That means that the evaporation can never be more than the potential. And the Boudicco curve nicely runs between them. And then here, this distance between the moisture constraint and the curve, this is the runoff coefficient. Here we plotted the water balance of some of the larger river basins of the world within the Boudicco diagram. The wet catchments, the Amazon, the Paraná, the Ganges and the Yangtze have a less than one aridity and have a large runoff coefficient, more than 40%. The others lie in drier territories and have a smaller runoff coefficient. The plots don't lie exactly on the curve. There may be many reasons for that, among them errors of observation or calculation. But there are also physical reasons related to the landscape, the geology, the climate or the vegetation. But this goes a bit beyond the scope of this lecture. If you are interested, there is a lot of literature that you can refer to. There are four meteorological factors that affect evaporation. The energy balance, driven by incoming solar radiation, the humidity of the air, and the aerodynamic resistance. We start with the radiation balance. The net incoming radiation, the net incoming shortwave radiation, is the amount of shortwave radiation entering the top of the atmosphere, indicated by Ra minus the amount that is reflected or absorbed by the clouds, which is Rc, minus the part that is reflected by the Earth's surface, which is small r times Rc, minus the part of the energy that is lost by long wave radiation, Rb. The reflectivity is called the albedo, or the whiteness, 
a completely black surface has an albedo of zero. It absorbs all radiation. Snow, on the other hand, has an albedo close to one, reflecting almost all incoming radiation. We can measure the incoming radiation RC and the outgoing radiation fluxes, uh, small r, r times RC and RB, with a radiometer. We have deployed a radiometer in the field, which measures incoming shortwave radiation. It has two probes, one is measuring upwards and the other is measuring downwards. The readings of these probes are displayed on the laptop in watt per meter squared. As you can see, we have deployed the downward-looking probe above a pavement. The upward-looking probe, which directly catches the incoming radiation, measures about 200 watt per square meter, whereas the downward-looking probe receives only 25 watt per square meter. What would happen if we change the surface underneath the downward-looking probe? Now the downward-looking probe measures about 55 watt per square meter. The value of the upward looking probe also changed a bit due to the changing cloud cover, but the rate between these two values shows that the grass reflects much more radiation than the pavement did before. We can also use a more classical instrument to determine the number of hours of sunshine. The Campbell Stokes Sunshine Recorder. Depending on where you are on Earth, there are different empirical formulas to calculate RC as a function of the number of sunshine hours and shortwave radiation, RA. The potential number of hours depends on the time of the year and the position on Earth. This is tabulated and so is the shortwave radiation occurring above the clouds. The outgoing long-wave radiation, Rb, is also calculated with a semi-empirical equation based on the long-wave radiation of a warm body. The left part of the equation contains the Stefan Boltzmann coefficient. Sigma and Ta is the actual temperature near the surface. The right part contains the effect of clouds, which reduce the outgoing radiation like a blanket. The middle part contains the air humidity, indicated by Ea. Water vapor being a strong greenhouse gas. So if the air is dry, there is more outgoing long-wave radiation. Other greenhouse gases are not included in this equation, but humidity is because it is a strong and highly variable greenhouse gas. This brings us to the humidity, which not only affects the long wave radiation, but also directly influences evaporation. Let's first look at the relation for saturated vapor pressure. On the horizontal axis is the temperature and on the vertical axis the pressure at which water vapor is saturated in the air and reaches the point of condensation. This is called the saturation vapor pressure, expressed in kilopascal or in kilonewton per square meter. The equation can be derived theoretically from entropy considerations. The slope of the curve is S. But how do we get onto the curve from a given point P. Imagine we are in this point P, with temperature Ta and saturation pressure Ea, reflecting the number of moisture molecules per unit volume. If we now move left to the curve, we have reached the dew point, Td, where the molecules start to condense. We can also move up until we reach the curve. But now we are increasing the number of molecules until the pressure is so high that they condense. But there, are also, there also is a spontaneous way to reach the curve. If we have a wet surface, like a wet sponge for instance, if you blow wind over a wet sponge, the fast molecules will leave and the sponge will get cooler 
until it reaches the dew point, but at a higher vapor pressure because it has absorbed energy from the surrounding warmer air and it follows the red arrow. This equation shows how it happens. It can be demonstrated by the psychrometer, which has a wet and dry bulb thermometer. We need, to, we need the psychrometer, uh, we need, sorry, we need the psychrometric constant gamma to be able to calculate the actual vapor pressure and hence the relative humidity. So here we see a psychrometer. It has two bulbs. The right bulb has this wet sock wrapped around it and the left bulb is the dry one. At the moment these thermometers are still indicating the same temperature. But when I sling it for a while, now you can see that these temperatures have started to deviate. Apparently the right bulb, the wet one, lost a few degrees of temperature as a result of evaporation. The energy balance states that the change of energy stored in the ground equals the difference between the net incoming radiation, the sensible heat flux H, the advected heat A and the latent heat of evaporation rho times lambda times the evaporation. All energy terms are in watts per square meter or joule per second per square meter. We may assume that average over a day, the change of energy stored is negligible and we generally also neglect advection. This results in an expression for the evaporation, depending on the balance between net incoming radiation and the sensible heat flux. This is the basis for the so-called Penman equation. Besides the energy balance, it makes use of empirical relations. It uses four standard meteorological variables, air temperature, relative humidity, wind velocity and net radiation. Penman assumed that the sensible heat flux H is correlated to the latent heat flux, evaporation. We could then rework the equation to obtain the equation for open water evaporation EO. We recognize the symbols that we have already seen before. The slope of the saturation pressure curve S, the net incoming radiation Rn, the density of the water rho, the energy required to evaporate a kilogram of water lambda, the specific heat of air, the difference between the saturation and actual vapor pressure and the aerodynamic resistance. You see it here. <laughs> Which is the driver of the turbulence that exchanges air with air layers higher up. It exchanges heat and moisture with the atmosphere through diffusive transport. Montes expanded the open water equation of Penman to a vegetated area. He introduced the crop resistance RC, which provides a break on the transpiration of vegetation as a result of environmental constraints. The crop resistance depends on the opening of stomata in the leaves, which reacts to the availability of moisture in the soil, the relative humidity, the sunlight for photosynthesis and the temperature. Plants don't like it when it is too hot or too cold. The details of this go beyond this lecture, but it is not a bad idea to read the paper by Lan Wang who explains this in detail. Here you see this paper, it's open access. There are different ways in which components of evaporation can be measured directly. At catchment scale, it can be done on the basis of the water balance that we know very well. E is P minus Q minus the SDT. But there are also instruments 
such as the evaporation pan, the lysimeter, or the shallow lysimeter. The pan is the most simple way of measuring the open water evaporation as a function of the atmospheric conditions. Through an empirical equation, the open water evaporation can be derived from the observed pan evaporation. But open water evaporation is not the same as the evaporation of a vegetated surface. The lysimeter, and these can be very large, very large things, ranging from 5 to 100 square meter or even more, is a way of calculating the total evaporation of a vegetated surface by weighing the storage and, of course, tracking all the water that goes in or is removed. For the measuring of interception, we have developed our own instruments. One of our students developed a device even to weigh a tree. And Dr. Kunders developed a shallow lysimeter to determine the ground interception, which is published in this open access journal. It has two containers, one on top and the other below, which are continuously weighed. The top one is permeable, the lower one has a tap. From the water balance, we can compute the evaporation from the soil. More advanced observations of evaporation are done by eddy covariance on a tower or by an instrument we developed ourselves, the DTS-based wet and dry cable approach, which is also published in Open Access. You can see that evaporation has many different aspects and that there still is a lot to investigate before we fully, fully understand. All the intricate ways in which water changes phase and phase in the hydrological cycle. But being difficult to grasp does not mean that it is unimportant. It still is the largest flux resulting from terrestrial precipitation. Which reminds me, we have not yet discussed precipitation much, but I'll see you in the next module about precipitation.